to welcome you this morning to Stony Point. We are so happy you have joined us uh, as we come together in worship of our Lord and Savior, uh, who sits on the throne regardless of what is happening in our world. And uh, no matter where you sit today, uh, no matter what you think about our current circumstances, God is still in control. And we come here this morning to worship him as a spiritual family united around that truth, the one truth that matters more than anything. There are a few things that we want to say to you this morning. As we gear up for uh, the fall at Stony Point, there are many things that we are involved in, and uh, COVID has not changed any of that. And one of those is our partnership with the Redwood Gospel Mission. Every year we get to uh, help support them uh, in feeding people in our community during our Thanksgiving season. Um, And this year, uh, uniquely, we have uh, partnered with them to gather 450 cans of corn and 450 cans of green beans. And already stacking up here in the corner, we have a nice pile. Um, And we just want to remind you, if you have forgotten them sitting in your house, or maybe you didn't pick them up yet, this coming Sunday, November 15th, is the last opportunity to do that. And so we would encourage you, please remember those uh, before we have to take them and drop them off to the Rebel Gospel Mission. And then in addition, another way that we are loving our community right now um, is through a blood drive that we will be having on uh, Tuesday, November 24th. You can sign up here at church uh, today, or you can sign up online, and you can find the link on our website or through our social media. And it is a wonderful way to be connected to our community, and it is a difficult thing right now to stay connected to the broader community and to reach out and love uh, the the area that we live in, Um, and this is one of those ways that we can do that. So we so encourage you, if you are eligible and capable of giving blood, uh, to please take care of that. And I just have one other reminder this morning. Uh, Many of you have asked about giving and how you can be a part of the work here at Stony Point. And that really is what we see it as being a part of the work of God through Stony Point and loving on our church through giving. Um, And you can do that several ways. You can drop off in the boxes either at the back of our sanctuary or as you come in this morning. Or you can mail it into the office, or you can give online. And we thank you for your faithfulness during these times. Uh, It is amazing to see how God's work goes forward no matter what. Amen. If you want to stand, we are going to worship this morning. Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. It's one of my favorite places to be, to be able to gather and worship together with him. And, um, yeah, I think, I don't know, I, I have some tangled here. I've got to get this off. Well, maybe I won't. Anyway, you can, I'll make it look a little funny. But um, one of my favorite worship songs is Only King Forever. And I think it's such a, a wonderful song that we're going to be able to sing this morning. And as Pastor Trevor was saying, um, that our, our hope is in the Lord. And in the second song we're going to sing, which is Cornerstone, it says, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, that we be found in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Daniel 2 says, starting in verse 20, says, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of a king. Amen. Let's praise him this morning, our only king forever, the only one that we raise our banners high to this morning.
you for who you are, God. We worship you and we lift you high this morning, God. I thank you for what you have done in our lives, Lord. What you are doing in our lives, God. What you will continue to do in our lives, God. For you put each person here for a reason, Lord. I pray this morning, God, that no matter what happens around us, in us, in our lives, God, that we would be able to turn to you, to turn our eyes upon you, God. Strengthen us. Strengthen us in our faith in you, Lord. Help us to draw closer to you, God. Bring a hunger into our hearts, Lord, to know more of you, who you are, Lord. That there might be revival in our lives. Worship and we praise you, Almighty King.
of our God. Amen. Amen. Would you just give him praise this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for who you are, God. We worship you this morning, Lord. And we, we love you, Jesus. May you fill our hearts this week and this morning, God. Help us to hear what you would have us to hear this morning from the truth of your word. Bless pastor as he comes to give it to us, God. And let us just hunger and thirst for it and for you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's do Psalms chapter 47 together this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Praise your holy name. Praise your name. Praise your name. Praise the Lord. If you would, turn the lights on uh, so I can see uh, who I'm looking at this morning. Remain standing if you would. I'm sorry. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We have some very urgent needs uh, in the membership of our church. Uh, Josh and Ashley Young are in Indiana this morning. I've already spoken with Josh today. His mother is in the hospital with COVID and uh, very, very much in need of a touch and an answer uh, of prayer. And um, so we want to pray for her. As many of you probably uh, found out this week, uh, Pastor Oz is going to be going in for a biopsy tomorrow. There's a spot on her rib. We're four years into this. And uh, she does such a wonderful and lovely job with our children's ministry and is such a sweetheart. Uh, She's a daughter to Tammy and I and her lovely family and parents. Um, she's the toughest thing I've seen. I've watched a couple of wonderful, wonderful ladies in this church deal with cancer and just the strength has been amazing and Roz is one of those, Pastor Roz. Uh, we also want to be in prayer for those in our congregation who need work and we have a couple 
Uh, we can thank the Lord that not very many and that we've been blessed as a congregation uh, in keeping our jobs through, through this time. But we do have some folks that need work. In particular, we want to pray for Martha this morning that God would guide her way and lead her to the right place and to the right employers and that he would provide above and beyond her wildest imaginations and um, that somebody will realize that they would be getting a really great employee uh, by hiring Miss Martha. So let's go to, if you have a request this morning, if you would just raise your hand, we're not going to be able to um, come and stand by you, but uh, we will, we do want to pray for you. It wouldn't serve us well to act as though we're living in a time where everything is just going the way we want it to. Uh, that's not what being a person of faith is about. We, we are facing real issues, extremely difficult issues. But we're here to tell you God is God. And he is going to see us through this. And he is going to answer. And we're going to submit to his will and his plan. And uh, we're going to take full advantage of the opportunity to go before him and to bring our needs this morning. So if you would join me in prayer. Father, we love you. We want you to know, Lord, that we are extremely grateful for your mercy and your grace and your saving work in each of our lives. No matter what situation is going on in our world or in our lives personally, Lord, help us to not lose sight of that we have been ultimately blessed by your work in our lives and the work of Jesus at the cross. We bring our needs before you, Lord, because your word says that we can. And we need you this morning. And we are unashamedly coming before you. You are the place that we go when we are in need. And we collectively acknowledge that your people need you right now, Lord. And so we bring our needs before you. We bring Martha before you who needs work. Who has been faithful to you and been faithful to her work and faithful to her employer. And faithful to her family. And she's hit a time in which she needs you. We ask, Lord, that you would go before her and prepare the way. And give her strength. And connect her with just the perfect employer. That will lead her to the place that you want her to be. We pray, God, for Josh, for Ashley, and for their girls, for the entire family, and for Josh's mother this morning, Lord. Be with them there in Indiana this morning, Lord. Have your hand upon them. We've already prayed, Father, that with them this morning, that you would fill that hospital room with your presence and your power, and that we would plead for your will to be done, and that we would trust in you but that we ask, Lord, for a miracle. We ask that you would bring complete healing, divine healing as only you can, and that it would lead to a testimony and a full understanding of who you are by all who are in the family. Reveal yourself, Lord, in their circumstances, I pray. We pray for Pastor Roz. We thank you, Lord, for bringing her into our lives and for her work here in this church and for the ministry that you have led her to and that the work that you do and the effectiveness that she has in working with the children of our church. We praise you, Lord, for seeing her through these last few years. And we ask, Father, that you would be with her again tomorrow as she goes for the biopsy, that your hand would go before her, that your will would go before her, and that you would sustain us in all of it, we pray for this precious family that has lost their child. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them, that they would feel your presence. That they would know you to be real in a way that they have never understood before. There is no darker path to walk in this life than what they are walking now. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with them. May they feel your love. May they not buy into the lie that you've left them just because this tragic thing has come their way. 
that you're there in the midst of it all and that you will see them through and that your grace is sufficient. We ask, Lord, that you would minister to them as only you can. Father, be with those who raise their hands, whose needs we're not aware of, but they made their need known before you and they express their faith and trust in you by raising their hand. We ask, Lord, that you would minister to their circumstances, to those who are lonely and doubtful and afraid and questioning what is going on, Lord. Build them up, strengthen them, renew their faith, make them strong again. For those, Lord, who are facing financial difficulty and several have spoken to me, I ask God that you would just touch their lives. May everything they put their effort toward be blessed by you. Lord, if this is a season in which we are to learn that you are faithful, even our, in our times of famine and doing without, Lord, if this is that season, may we learn what we're supposed to and may our faith be strong in you. Lord, if this is a moment and a time in which we are to learn to surrender to your will and your plan, we, we want to do that as well. We acknowledge, Lord, that now is a time for serious believers. Now is a time to learn serious things from you. And that in that you restore our joy and you bring us back to rejoicing. And you bring us back to dancing and you bring us back to lives filled with laughter. Only when we walk faithfully through the tough time. And we know we have to face the night before the joy comes in the morning, Lord. And we face it in your strength, not in our own. Bind us together in a unified way, Lord, that we would walk faithfully before you. In your holy name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. You can be seated. If you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. We're not going to stay there very long, but we, we need to look at one verse. I'm going to ask that you'd pray for me that I get through this this morning. There are times that we read Scripture, and if we're familiar with it, being human as we are, it just passes through our thinking and is gone. Whether we hear it read or someone quotes it to us or we hear it in a song, a Christian song, or we're listening to the radio and someone is speaking on the radio and we, we hear it and we think we already know that truth and so we just let go of it. Not necessarily realizing that it is the truth for the day. That it is the word for the day. And... By the time the Apostle Paul writes in chapter 3 to the church at Ephesus, he, is, he feels the need to already repeat himself. In chapter 1, he prays for them. And we get into chapter 3, and he's going to end up praying for them again, starting with verse 14. He starts, most students of the Bible and most theologians believe that he starts chapter 3 to pray for them. And then his mind goes, drawn by the Spirit, we all believe, to something else, and he begins to discuss something he's previously discussed with them. And I, I so am familiar with that idea. My mind goes like that. My mind, uh, uh, sometimes Samuel will say to me, how did you get to that thought? And it, it will, I will, I'll have to go back in my own mind and, and speak to her how I got to where I ended up when we, when we started where we started. It is the moment of being led by the Spirit somewhere. You didn't intend to go and you didn't know you were going to go. Now, in this life that we live now, every time we think that we hear something from the Spirit of God, we need to test it with the Bible. 
We don't need to just chase it thinking, okay, that's, we, we went there and it was of the Spirit. Because oftentimes I meet people where they get out there and, and, and what they're saying is of the Spirit isn't of the Bible. So it can't be of the Spirit of God. And so you have, Paul has this moment in which the Spirit takes him back to something he had previously written to them to remind them of something. In chapter 1, he does an introduction of himself as an apostle. And he says to them, I, uh, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he does that to establish his authority to write to them. And he speaks to them telling them that what he knows and what he's going to teach them and what he's going to write to them about didn't come from any source other than the Spirit of God guiding his mind and his heart and his hand. And so he gets to chapter 3 and he's introducing himself again. And he says it this way. Let's just read the, the, the first verse of chapter 3. For this reason I, and for this reason, he's going to use that phrase again. He's going to use it down in verse 14 when, he's, when he goes to pray for them. And so we see this gap between for this reason, and he's, he's talking about what he, what he had written to them in chapter 2 and in chapter 1. So by the time he gets to chapter 3, he feels the need to stop and pray for them again. And then he gets led of the Spirit and he introduces himself again in a very different way. In a way that you and I read so often and just dismiss it. We think to ourselves, it's just Paul introducing himself in chapter 3 to the Ephesians. But Paul talks about himself in this way many times in the scripture. It's an experience very familiar to Paul. You know how you and I talk sometimes, and, and I'm, I'm specifically like this. I, I'm, I'm especially like this. I relate everything to life experiences, to how God has worked in my life. And so if we're talking, and, I'm, and someone shares with me something, some biblical concept or some theological teaching or some doctrinal position, I will often relate that back to them in a life application, practical kind of a way that I have experienced myself, that I know what I'm talking about. We do that out of just our human nature. We say, this is where my life is, or this is the experiences I've had. And so I relate to God in the particular uh, subject that we're talking about based on my life experiences and based on how it's applied to my life. And then Paul goes on to testify of what God has done in his life as a prisoner. So as you and I relate to life experiences, Paul, when he writes, relates his relationship with God and his understanding of what he's going to call the mystery of God and the mystery of God's love for us, he, he relates to that as a prisoner. His present circumstances, as he writes, as I've said to you before, he is in prison in Rome and he is under house arrest. It is the easiest of Paul's prison's experiences. Most believe, most scholars of the scripture believe that Paul was in prison for five years. Two of those in Caesarea uh, and the, the rest of those in Rome. That he stood before Felix, he stood before Festus, he stood before King Agrippa. And he made a plea even to Caesar to be delivered. And he stood before the Sanhedrin and would in those occasions defend himself and still be imprisoned by those in authority. He is imprisoned in this particular situation because he has taken the gospel of Jesus Christ, the mystery that we're going to read about in, in Ephesians chapter 3, the mystery of God's work with human beings and the revelation of God to the Gentiles. Paul took the gospel to the Gentiles. He is, as we will read in Acts chapter 21 and Acts chapter 22 today, he tells us the story. We are told the story of what happens and why Paul is in prison when he writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 3. And so in chapter 3, he doesn't say Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ. Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And so he tells them, 
why he's going to end up praying for them and why he's in prison and why he is, he is doing what he is doing. So he, he is literally saying, I am in a, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, but it is, I am presently in prison for the sake of you Gentiles. Because I brought you the gospel. Because I gave up the security and the safety and the freedom of living as I had previously lived to stand up and take on the calling that God has put in his life to share the gospel with those who were afar off, as he had written in chapter 1, which were the Gentiles. Now, as we will read in Acts chapter 21, the reason he is in prison is because he is revealing to them the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we're going to go back and not rush through how Paul introduces himself this morning. Paul, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He first of all tells us that he doesn't feel imprisoned by his captors. In verse 13, he says to them, don't cry, don't weep, don't, don't be sorrowful that I'm in the present circumstances that I'm in. What he's saying is, don't misunderstand that I'm being held captive by the powers of this world. I am right where I'm supposed to be. Yes, it is in prison, but I am right where I'm supposed to be. I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing and it has caused me to be put in prison which is by God's divine plan exactly where I'm supposed to be. We sometimes, when we hear the word prisoner, we think you can only end up in prison if you do something wrong. We know that innocent people end up in prison all the time. And certainly around the world, people end up in prison not because they did something wrong, but often because they stood up for what was right. So when Paul describes himself as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we would look at him and he's saying to those uh, Christians in Ephesus, he's saying to them, you're crying and you're mourning and you're weeping I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I appreciate your concern and your love and all of that. But, but get beyond that and see that God's will and God's work sometimes leads you to very difficult places to do the very thing that he's called you to do. What is God calling us to do in our very difficult place that we are in right now? I believe that God is calling this church to be a lighthouse for the gospel of Jesus Christ, a true teacher of the word, lovers of God's word, followers of Christ Jesus, and that further step where we say we are prisoners of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's not standing up and saying, I'm supposed to be the only prisoner for Jesus. He's writing to them saying, you are facing difficulty and they're facing heresy, they're facing persecution. Some of them are afraid to go out into the streets. They are facing difficult times and he's writing to them and say, yes, you may be, feel imprisoned. And I've heard people describe our present circumstances as though they feel captive in their own house and all of that. And you may feel imprisoned, but you don't have to be a prisoner of your circumstances. You need to stand up and realize you may be a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, put in the present circumstances you are in by the divine will of God. Meaning... Will we stop and think and pray and seek God to find out what he wants from his prisoners in the present circumstances that we are in? Now let's talk about the, the elements of being a prisoner, the life of a prisoner. You are held captive because you have been captured. Paul is saying, I've been captured for the cause of Christ. And when you read Acts chapter 22, you find out that's exactly what happened. He was making his way into Damascus. And the power of God shone a great light, knocked him off his donkey and captured him. Took control of him. Paul is saying, I 
was about doing my own thing, seeing the world through my own vision, living my own life, and then all of a sudden I was on my road, the road that I thought that I had chosen, but I was on a road apparently that God had chosen, and I was struck by a great light, knocked off the donkey, the Spirit of God confronted me, and I was brought to a revelation in Christ Jesus of the saving work of Christ, the very one that I had been persecuting his followers, I, followers, I am now one of his followers, and I'm going further than being just a follower. I am a captured person for Jesus. I'm a prisoner. Prisoners are captured. I'm looking for captured Christians. I want to see people who God took over their lives, where he changed them drastically, where they became the, the central purpose of their being was to be a follower and prisoner of Jesus. Not concerned with everything else in the world. Not afraid of everything else in the world. Not putting everything else before their calling in Christ Jesus. But absolutely at the center of the purpose of their life that they are a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Prisoners have no freedom. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Don't say that in today's church freedom to do what they want to freedom to live the way they want to freedom to get up and decide where they're going to go we're going to read if we get to it we're going to read in Acts chapter 21 and 22 where people came to Paul prophets came to Paul and said don't go to Jerusalem don't go over there because you will be captured. Your freedom will be taken. And the Bible says that Paul would not be convinced by them because he was following the plan that God had for his life. They gave him a vision of what was going to happen to him. He knew he was going to be captive. He knew he was going to be taken and captured and imprisoned. And he went anyway. What it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ is you follow Jesus anyway. Knowing that you're not going to be popular, knowing that you're not going to be in the in crowd, knowing that you're not going to get, be favored by everybody, knowing that you're not going to be loved by the crowd. In Acts, we see the Apostle Paul being uh, taken into custody and the crowds are yelling, take him away, take him away. But every believer that had come to Jesus because of his preached word and because of his dedication and because of his surrender and his submission to the will of God, every one of them had come to the saving revelation of what we see in Ephesians as being the great mystery of God's love for us and how he brought salvation to the Gentiles. Paul was the prisoner of Jesus that brought it to him. And here it is, guys. Here it is. This is where the church and follower, the modern day follower of Jesus Christ doesn't want to take this step. Prisoners can have no will of their own. With no judgment, please understand, with no judgment. When's the last time you submitted to God? Where it was something you wanted and you felt that it was, wasn't right when God and you submitted. Or something you didn't necessarily want and God was leading you that way and you knew it in your heart and your spirit anyway. You don't have those confrontations with God. I have them all the time. Where I would surrender my will to his will. Prisoners have no will. Lord, I have no will of my own. Tammy and I make big plans. At the end of those big planning sessions, we have to say, God, we have no will of our own. We sat down in the best wisdom we have. We tried to, 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 to plan out the next few days, the next few years, the next the rest of our lives, the, how, what we're going to do, all those kinds of things. God, we have no will of our own. 
Change them if you want to, Lord. I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Change them if you want to, Lord. This is what we want for our grandkids, Lord, but you change it if you want to. This is how I hope my life goes, Lord, and, and this is, I, I hope for good health, I hope for all those things, Lord, but you just change it however your plans want them to go. I have no will of my own. I read a story this week about a missionary to the Philippines who were captured by a terrorist group and was held for 379 days. Early in their capture, charitable groups, relief groups, were able to bring food into them and check on their health. They would allow, the terrorist group would allow them to come in, check on their health. And early in their capture, the husband looked at the wife and said, the Bible tells us that we are to serve the Lord with gladness. So we're going to serve the Lord with gladness till our very last breath. One of the chores that this missionary had was carrying the heavy baggage and, and equipment and what, whatever was needed in the rough terrain of the jungle areas of the Philippines where the terrorists would hide Day by day, with just marginal food, he grew weaker and weaker, and he would stumble. And he would remind himself that the call of God on his life was to serve the Lord with gladness. He was so effective at serving the Lord with gladness that his captors would draw straws at the end of the night to see who had to chain him back up. They didn't want to. Because of the way he treated them during the day. He continued his faithful service to them. When the relief workers would bring food, he would share the food with the lesser members of this terrorist group that didn't get enough food. And he would talk to them about the ways of God and the love of God. And little by little, he started bringing some of these terrorists to the Lord. And you say, oh, that's wonderful. God must look down upon that and see him and think, I've got to deliver that man. He's doing such a good job of serving the Lord with gladness that the ultimate end is going to be deliverance. It wasn't. The relief workers would bring back the stories of, of this missionary. And finally one day they brought back the story that he'd been killed. Because he was a prisoner of the Lord. With no will of his own. No freedom beyond that which of being free in the spirit. Which is the ultimate freedom. Freedom. There are people around the world today who are physically being held captive as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ and all they did was stand up for what was right to the point of losing their own freedom, their own will. We face some difficult times, some tragic times even. We've had some losses All God's ask of us is to serve the Lord with gladness. If your gladness has been taken away from you in the midst of this, and I see that. I see that with people who, whose hearts are just so overcome. I want to remind you, God has his eye upon you. People came to Paul when Paul was in prison, and we get this in verse 13 of chapter 3, which we'll be looking at next week. We'll get all the way down to verse 13. Somebody say, I don't believe it. 
Thank you. In verse 13, we see people coming to Paul and saying, we don't want you to have to go through this. So we're going to pray and ask God that you don't have to go through this. This is, this is what you can, it is inferred in that verse. We have got to learn to pray according to your will, Father. Because sometimes we think God only does the deliverance stuff and God only takes us out of things and God only is with us when we are riding high and everything's just booming and everything's going the way we want it to and, and we're being blessed everywhere. No, some of the most powerful and perhaps the most powerful work that God does in our life is done in those moments when we are in prison. And people are coming to us. Don't you get mad at them sometimes? I see people get frustrated. Don't try to take me out of God's plan. It's almost like we said, you know, everybody's saying, cheer up, cheer up, cheer up, cheer up. Serve with gladness. But we're not trying to turn this into a gladness moment because you're in prison. Trials are coming your way. Paul was beaten in the moment that he was arrested. He was beaten so badly that the Roman leadership had to take him from the Jews who were beating him. Only to find out he too is, was a Jew. And he stands up in, in chapter 22 and preaches a sermon to them about how he came to Christ and the revelation that we see him talking about in chapter 3 of Ephesians. And he says to them, there's a price to be paid. And people around the world are paying the price. I read this week about Corey Tim Boom. And she made this statement, and it's just so powerful. Oh, I wish I could be as strong as that lady was. She said, wherever I find myself in the world, I assume that that's where God wants me to preach the gospel. <laughs> Including a concentration camp. Wherever I find myself in the world, I assume that that's where God wants me to preach the gospel. Whatever circumstances I find myself in. I'll allow myself momentary shock at where I'm at. Then I want to come to the realization and the revelation that I'm here for the gospel. Paul writes and says, I, Paul, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ for the sake of you Gentiles. These are tough times that we could look at each other and say, I, Tammy, or I, Marty, or I, Jesse, or I, Greg, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ for the cause of my family. For the sake of my family, I'm going to be a prisoner of the Lord. For the sake of my neighborhood, I'm going to be a prisoner of the Lord. For the sake of my office at work, where I cannot talk about you, but I'm going to bring the Spirit of God with me every day. For the sake of my neighborhood, for the sake of my extended family, for the sake of my grandchildren, for the sake of the very newest person that I have met in this congregation, I want to be a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you've got to sign up for that. That's not going to happen by chance. It's not going to happen if you just let life happen. It's not going to happen if you don't pay attention. One of my favorite movies, which I watch over and over with my granddaughters, is Sister Act. Act where she stands up and says to her music class, I think it's Sister Act, Sister Act 2, where she stands up in the music class and makes them sing, if you want to be somebody, if you want to go somewhere, you better wake up and pay attention. The church better wake up and pay attention if we want to be what we're supposed to be in the midst of this situation. It's not going to be done, and it's not going to happen by listening to the world. We're going to have to get into the Word of God. We're going to have to get into the Spirit of God. We're going to have to get into prayer, and we're going to have to sign up to be prisoners of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that means there are some folks that don't like me, then that's okay. Because I love them anyway. Only through the power 
and the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you be a prisoner for Jesus? Captured by the gospel, the revelation that we're going to look at next week. We're going to look at the plan, the preaching, the purpose, and the privilege that comes with the revelation of the gospel next week. And today we looked at being a prisoner of that gospel. But it's up to you. If you want to be able to serve the Lord with gladness, you're going to have to sign up to be a prisoner and a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand with me. I want us to have a closing prayer. And then our worship team is going to lead us in a song to be dismissed to. I would ask that you would spend this week, uh, this week time in prayer with the challenge that I put before you a few weeks ago of fasting a meal and focusing. It's not just sacrificing. Fasting is not just sacrificing. It's focusing too. So to, to leave one thing that you love to focus on the thing that you love most. And that is your walk in Christ. And so I'm going to ask you to pray for the prayer request that we, we mentioned this morning. And specifically for those who are facing physical ailments uh, that are time sensitive. Uh, we need, we need Lord, the Lord to act according to his plan and will. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you and praise you. Your abundant goodness to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the spirit that comes alive when I read your word. and When people read your word. Thank you for the hope of your word, the victory in your word, and for the challenge in your word. And we've been challenged today by reading your word to be a prisoner. Lord, we've stopped and we've paused and looked at one verse. Press it so deeply into our spirit this morning, Lord, that we can't forget it. That we can't brush it aside. And that when we come to that moment this week where we have to decide that we have no will of our own and we're surrendering to the will of God, that we will be victorious. Help us to be victorious in that moment. If there's anyone here, Lord, this morning who for the very first time would realize that they are a sinner and they need you to work the miraculous mystery of salvation in their lives, let them know, God, that they can just cry out to you in mercy, admitting their sin right now, Asking for forgiveness of that sin and asking you to come into their life and be their savior. And give them the confidence that it happens instantly. You forgive them their sin. And they know you instantly and they are a child of yours instantly. Redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Give them the confidence and the boldness to share that with somebody. That they've prayed that prayer. Help them to acknowledge that and ask for help in walking this walk of faith. In your precious holy name we pray. And everyone said, Amen.